Sorry, I'm a little bit late here. Um, today, we're going to kind of continue moving from the units uh, analysis, talking about units, why they're important, all that, and start coming into really the core of the class in terms of the, the tools we need to perform the calculations. So today we're going to talk about the reactions and reactors. You'll hear me several times today distinguish between that physical reactor, whatever the reaction is happening inside, uh, and comparing that to the reaction itself, whatever chemical, biological, physical thing is happening inside the reaction. Um, next time we'll get into a chemical overview, just kind of brush you up on chemistry. Um, my plan is to get you a homework posted by probably the end of this week or before next class. That'll kind of cover some of the chemistry, so you feel free to look at it first. Some of that will be optional. I'll explain that very clearly on the homework. It's basically the first page. If you're already familiar with chemistry, you don't have to worry about that. Um, but it's, it's kind of up to you. I'm not going to grade it one way or the other. Um, and then the rest of it will be some more problems. A couple of chemistry problems that are required, just to be sure that you're up to speed, doing some calculations, and otherwise, uh, just a few problems on mass balances. Again, getting you comfortable with the types of problems we'll be, we'll be solving. So that'll be a um, relatively small homework, I think, especially if you, if you consider how much I'm, you know, what parts I'm grading. Um, and then the, uh, we'll, we'll move on from chemistry, then we'll end up hitting sedimentation and some of those processes. That'll be the second component. That'll be a second homework. And then we'll have our exam. Okay, so today we're going to talk about reactions, reactors. Um, I don't think we'll get to chemistry just yet, so we'll add on to that next time. Um, so here we go. When we think of a reactor, um, you might think of some vessel, some black box, something happening inside. Really, it can be anything. You can use a bottle of water as a reactor, right? You can use that little bucket sitting there with um, sanitation wipes as a reactor. You just put something in it, give it something that's going to cause a reaction. Maybe you're growing yeast to make your homemade bread. There's biological reactions happening. Uh, they also cause some chemical reactions. So you've got all that bubbling of CO2 uh, inside your yeast causing the, the bread to rise, all of that. And so when we think about environmental engineering, usually we're going to be dealing with water treatment, wastewater treatment in this class. So we might think of a, a reactor kind of like this. We see this, um, what's effectively an activated sludge um, basin here. And so really what's happening is we've got this wastewater coming in, we're bubbling air through it, letting all these bacteria consume the oxygen in the air so that they can munch on the, the junk in there. We'll talk more about that um, later in the class. But effectively you've got physical reactions, simply air um, going from, from the uh, gas phase into the dissolved phase, that you can call that a kind of a physical reaction um, and model it that way. You've also got a biological reaction happening, all these bacteria consuming stuff, and some chemi chemical reactions involved because they're chemically changing the stuff in solution. So you've got all that stuff happening and in some system. We're going to look at several designs here where you might see this, um, some sort of box, uh, and we have maybe a flow coming in, flow going out. We're often assuming that it's mixed. We'll cover some top, some cases where um, maybe it, the mixing is uh, more specific than just the whole thing is mixed. But that's kind of the thing. We've got any type of reaction in some vessel, in some reactor. Um, so the we're going to make a distinction um, and you'll see it, it'll become important when we start looking at, okay, what does this mean for a mass balance so that we can solve for um, some sort of a, uh, a talent, you know, a question on an exam, on a homework. Maybe we want to know how much oxygen are we adding to the system, how much will be required. In order to do that, you know, we're given some design criteria. We need to reduce the waste by X amount. So how do we get there? We need to model that mass balance to find our answer. So that's um, the basics of what we're covering today is setting up those mass balances. Okay. All right, so here 
we have, um, we'll talk first about reactions, okay? So a reaction can happen in any kind of box, in any kind of vessel, in any kind of reactor. So we're gonna hone in on just the reaction itself. This includes physical, biological, chemical, right? Any type of reaction. It doesn't have to be a chemistry reaction here. We're expanding the scope to mean, okay, if we have two particles floating around in water and they collide and stick together to form one new particle, we're calling that a reaction. It's a reaction between two particles to form one new particle. Uh, that's that's going to be really our first, first major use of these uh, reactions. So actually, I'm going to make a note here as I find my... Pardon me a moment. writing pad in properly. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so if we take a look at the, these different cases, we're, what we're gonna describe our reactions, the way we're gonna describe them is first of all, let me, let me give you a little bit of context. When we're writing our mass balance, we've got this general form, we talked about that before, that's gonna really be the form of any mass balance we do. It might get a little more complicated, you know, if we have multiple inputs, multiple outputs, something like that. Technically, you could have multiple reactions. We're basically gonna stick with just identifying one reaction and going with that um, for our class. So when I talk about reactions, that's going to go into this term. It's not, it's not exactly that term, so when we come up with some rate equation, um, this rate, this will go into it, but it's not the whole picture. Usually we're going to have um, volume times this R of C. Okay, so when we're dealing with this mass balance, again, we have to end up with units that are mass per time. We're always dealing with mass per time here because that's our accumulation. So when we're thinking about this um, this reaction term, the reaction order is going to determine what, what's inside here. So we have three reaction orders. Um, some of you may remember from uh, chemistry, especially chemical engineers, probably very familiar already. But the reaction order is essentially the degree to which our reaction depends on the stuff that's reacting. Okay, So if you think of it, um, money in a bank or perhaps negative money as a loan you've taken from a bank, right, to do student loans. I've still got a few of those myself. You think about what's happening as it's sitting there in the bank or you know, wherever it is. It can be earning interest or um, incurring interest, right? So this amount of stuff in the bank, if you model it mathematically, that interest rate comes in and you have some rate here, the K, and you multiply that by the principle of your balance, which is the C, and you multiply, and you take that C, I'm sorry, let me see if I can put that, there. you put that C here, in this case we're going to use a concentration of stuff, but in, in your bank that would be the principal balance, and you raise that to some power, and you add this amount every time, every year, every month, something like that. So this order right here, that reaction order typically is one for a bank account because it depends on to one time um, on the amount of money you have there, right? So if, you're, if you have a 10% interest rate in one year, you're going to take what you have in there, take 10% of that and add it to it, right? And that's your, your new principle for the next year. Um, or that's 
maybe the amount that of interest that you gained. Okay, so that's that's the deal, um, and you just do it one time on that money. Now that's different than just depositing a hundred dollars per month into a bank account. If you're doing one hundred dollars per uh, per month, then you actually that does not depend at all about how much is in there. So the C should go to zero, or well, it should go to one. And you can do that by taking that N, and if you put zero there, then the amount, the, the change in your balance, the DC, per month or per time, whatever unit you're doing, ends up just being that rate. And that rate, in my example here, would just be $100 per month. Um, and so multiplied by the amount of money in your bank time, to, um, to, to the power of zero. So no time is dependent on that. So it's a little convoluted to explain it all out that way, but we should be able to, to show you um, kind of this practical example of how these rates are going to work. It was something that you've used before. Okay, and if you were to consider this as a full mass balance, maybe you have, you're wondering how much money is going to accumulate in your bank account given that you have some withdrawals some deposits, and that interest, right? So you could actually model your whole bank account stuff with, um, with a system like this. Okay, so if we take a look at, um, let's say, a zero order reaction, we're gonna put this zeroth order, and what we're gonna look at is this, the amount of stuff that's in solution. So, you know, again, the analogy being money in your bank. Okay, so the amount of concentration in water, let's say, if you have a zero order change with respect to time, then you've got, you know, let's say you start at zero with a, an increase, you're just gonna have a linear increase. You're adding the same amount over time. That's a growth reaction. You could also have a decay reaction. Um, so we could, we could do this way and just have a linear line like that as a decay. So this would be growth or decay. And what you see from this rate equation, if we set it up uh, like I have here, so R of C, that's the same thing as DC DT. This is going to be equal to, uh, in the zero order case, plus or minus K. That plus or minus is where we're getting the, the growth or decay. All right, so that's captured within this rate term. Now if we take a first order, then this is going to be like your bank account, and it's going to be exponential. So something like that, or maybe you have exponential decay, and it's going to look something like, a little bit like that. Okay? So again, stuff that you've seen before, and if you take it to, um, to the power of two here for a second order um, rate, we're not gonna use these very often. Um, I just want you to be aware of them. Then it's gonna be, um, a bit more parabolic. So it'll end up looking a lot sharper. Um, you know, I did that completely wrong, I'm sorry. Um, a minute ago. I guess you correct me. Should look like this, right? <laughs> okay, so this one, in this case, um, for the decay, it would end up looking more like that, uh, a very sharp, you know, that second order dependence. All right. Okay. What's that? I, I said parabolic. That's not the right term. I'm sorry. Um, but if you were to if you were to plot this as, you know, this equation equals something like two two x squared, this side of it would would be going up, right? We're not going to deal with the negative side. Okay. Okay. Right, any other questions here? Okay, so we're gonna mostly focus on zero order and first order, and to be quite honest, most of the problems will be first order, because that tends to be what we're most interested in. 
I'm going to expect you to be able to work with both of those. The derivations for the overall mass balance stuff gets a bit more complicated. You'd have to remember a little bit more um, from differential equations for the second order. You guys could do it, and it's, it's not that bad. Um, but I just think that it, we don't really need it for most anything we were going to work with. There's a few occasions with really highly reactive radicals for advanced oxidation stuff comes into play, but really most of the stuff we're going to deal with is is typically first order, sometimes zero. Yeah. When you say first order, you mean n equals one? Yes. When I say first order, I always mean that n equals one. Um, and yeah, that, let me clarify here because I was talking about n equals zero for the zero order. Um, so this is really the reaction order. So if you ever forget what we're talking about, just remember for the rate equation, just set that n there equal to whatever order it is. And you can actually derive, the, um, derive it backwards to figure out uh, you're, maybe you're given some rate constant and you have the units for the rate constant. We'll talk about this a little more in a moment. But you can end up deriving the rate order based on the, the units you're given for k. So that'll you'll see that uh, becomes important sometimes. Yeah. So for the v times r c squared there, was the v representing volume? Or? Yeah. When I was when I was talking about v times r c, um, usually what we'll have what we'll be inserting into that reaction equation will have a so the volume will be um, volume units so that the rate this dc dt ends up if we multiply mass per volume divided by time by volume then we end up with mass per per time um, is the total units so basically you know we can check it to make sure that our accumulation value here uh, that that term is equal to the, on the unit space is equal to those terms, right? Whatever your input term is in should be mass per time. You know, to, in order to actually add or subtract it directly, you have to have the same units, right? Because then you get some, some weird equation that doesn't work if you don't. Okay. Okay, so let's take a closer look. Um, we'll start with zero order reactions. And here we have, you know, again, this, this equation R of C or DC DT is equal to plus or minus K times C to the zero power here. Um, what we're defining these terms as is C will be a concentration. Um, I'm using milligrams per liter as an example. It doesn't have to be milligrams per liter, but it has to be a concentration, um, or at least what we're going to work with is will be in concentrations. So that's why I've plotted all these on with C as the y-axis concentration um, milligrams per liter. K is going to be uh, the rate constant. For a zero-order reaction, we have to have this rate constant account for the same units as dc dt. So if we take a look at the units that are going to come out of dc dt, that's going to be okay, a change in concentration, so milligrams per liter per time, um, and K has to satisfy all of the units here because we have no C. So K then is going to have to be in milligrams per liter times time, which is exactly what we have in this K. So again, this units analysis um, can show us exactly, uh, exactly what we need. Um, That's, that's where we got that. And this is a mess, so I'm going to erase some of it. Okay. All right, so that's, again, how we can know uh, the units. If you forgot what order it is or you need to decide what order it is to see what to do with your reaction, um, take a look at the units of the rate constant, the lowercase k. Okay, so if we take a look at how, what this is going to do, if you're just looking at the reaction, no inputs, no outputs, just, just the reaction itself, um, and you take a look at how concentration is changing over time, uh, we just drew this a moment ago, it's going to look like this, either growth or decay, and if we take the, um, the, the derivative of that, 
so dc dt um, versus time, we should just have a flat line. Okay, um, this is again just pretty basic calculus, but I'm just pointing out that what we see here is the slope is constant, um, and that makes sense when we look at our equation. That's for zero order reactions. We'll in a few minutes we'll work on putting these into reactors to do a solve a mass balance on a reactor scale. Okay, so first order reactions. Um, we've talked about the example of a bank account. Um, I'll write that here. So earning interest in a bank account. So we have the rate of change equal to DC, you know, DC dt is equal to plus or minus k times c to the one power, which is just c, right? So plus or minus kc. And when we do the integral, um, we're going to we're to integrate this in a little bit as to in order to get it into our reaction equation. Then what we'll see is um, this is going to come out just like you're familiar with it from dealing with uh, interest rates. You actually worked with this this exact equation back in algebra in high school or whenever you took that, and you would have seen that. Um, you'll you'll see that and you'll be like, oh, that's where it's coming from, right? I, I knew that, but I never put these together this way. Okay, so again, um, in this case, the concentration would be changing as a function of time uh, exponentially. And if you look at the dc dt, this is going to be um, a constant, uh, not a constant, but it will be changing at a constant rate. Um, so the would look something like this. All right. So we can do this, and we'll do this for the um, second order as well. Uh, before we get there, um, let's take a note to, to take a look at the units here. So again, I'm using seconds and milligrams and liters as examples. We could be dealing with cubic meters for volume. We could be dealing with kilograms or molar units, something else for the concentration. Um, we could be using hours, days, years for the time. I'm just using seconds here. Um, keep in mind these, these units, it's important what form they're in, not necessarily what type like in terms of seconds or minutes or whatever. So when we have a first order rate, you know, with respect to time, and we're always going to be doing with respect to time, um, when we have a first order rate, it's always going to be in per time for the rate constant. Um, and again, this, this math works out exactly the same where ultimately what we have is um, some mass per volume per time for the DC dt. And so when we, we take that as our entire units that we need, I'll just write it here, DC dt is in the, this form, then our k times c has to match that. So k times c to the power of 1, I'll just write it as c. Um, that has to match. So we know c is mass per volume. So I'm going to write that under here, mass per volume. And we need mass per volume per time. So the k has to provide the time, then per time, really. So here it's 1 over time. So that's, that's how we can derive and see that 1 over time should be our units for K for a first order reaction. Okay. So anytime we see a reaction and it gives you the reaction rate constant, that rate constant's units are per time, that means we've got a first order uh, reaction on our hands. Okay. Second order, um, again, this is something we're not really going to use very often. Uh, I do want you to be familiar enough to recognize the same process that we've just looked at. It's getting repetitive by now, but it's the same exact process, right? So we have um, plus or minus kc to the power of 2, 
And again, C is just our concentration. Um, K is our rate constant, and I uh, did not put the correct units here. So we'll derive those. Um, time is in seconds. So what we'll have here is when we want dc dt, this is going to be equal, again, mass per time times volume. So this has to be coming from k c squared. So let's start with c squared and look at where that gets us and see what k has to satisfy in order to make the, the total equation to be mass per time per volume. Okay, so c squared is going to give us milligram squared per liter squared or mass squared per volume squared and so k needs to satisfy then our time so we'll put seconds here and basically um, we are we are almost there except we have one too many milligrams and one too many liters so we actually have to kind of do the inverse of a zero order and say liters are going to go up here for the k and milligrams down here so when you multiply that you'll cancel out one of the milligrams and one of the liters you'll end up with milligrams per liters per second Yeah, I wrote it as liters per second per milligram. Yeah. It's, yeah, I just wrote it. I wrote it with the seconds before the milligrams. It doesn't matter yeah. either way. Yeah, you'll you'll usually see it liters per milligram second. That's like standard how you'll always see it. Um, I'm just strange and wrote it out that way. Okay, so ultimately this gives you milligrams per liters per second, um, and the units then for k, I should have wrote are liters per milligram per second. Okay. And I'll, I'm going to be uploading this copy that I've written on, so if I correct it, you know, th this is, this is the best correction I can give you right now. Okay. All right. So, uh, again, we looked at this already in terms of what this would look like for the reaction. And it would, would kind of look something like that you know, depending on the exact parameters. And then if you were to look at the derivative, that would just look like the, you know, the first order case um, for C versus T. Uh, so that would be, again, the exponential growth or exponential decay. Okay, we're not really going to use this very much. It's a little more complicated to integrate, and we need to integrate these when we put them into our rate equations or once we're solving our mass balance. And again, like I said, it's actually very, uh, it's not very common for a reaction to depend on the amount that's in there to the second power, um, at least in the scope of environmental engineering water treatment applications. All right, any questions on the reaction orders? All good? All good in the chat, hopefully? People watching online? Perfect. Okay. So, um, moving on from reactions, we're going to go to reactors. So, like I said earlier, think of a reactor as just the physical boundary that we're using to do our reaction. This is going to what's this is what will allow us to do the mixing, and do all these things, so that we have, um, you know, it's it's the physical container. It does not relate to the reaction order. So the reaction order has no bearing on what reactor we use and vice versa, right? We can do any type of reaction in any type of reactor based on what makes sense. Okay, so we have three types and really what we're going to um, be looking at is how, how the reactor itself affects what's coming in, what's going out, um, those two components are really what we're going to be uh, focused on here. Oops. So most of the reactor stuff is going to affect that component. Obviously, the accumulation rate is sort of our, what we're solving for in a sense, or we'll assume it's zero and then we'll solve for stuff inside. But um, 
So whereas reactions themselves, the reaction order has relevance to the reaction term, the reactor type is more relevant to what's happening inputs, outputs. Okay, that said, we have these three types. One is a batch. Um, the next is what we call a CSTR. There's a few names for it. Um, it's basically continuously mixed, continuously stirred. It also has flow through coming, um, coming in and going out. Sometimes you'll call them a continuous flow stirred tank reactor, uh, continuously mixed reactor. The implications is it's just like the batch, but you put a hose in on each side. Okay. Um, then we have what's called a plug flow reactor, PFR. And that's actually a lot more like a just a hose itself where we have, you can think of what's happening inside it as a little batch reactor that's flowing through the system. So whatever's happening in that batch will be basically the same thing. You know, you give it a, as much time as it takes to go through the system and get, get to the end point and that's your, your system. Okay, so we're gonna go in, in depth on each of these. And again, any type of reaction can be happening in any of these. So keep in your mind separate the reactions from the reactors. Okay, so batch reactors. These are very convenient um, for lab studies because when we take a look at it, we have no inputs and no outputs. That means that in our equation here, we have where my cursor go. So in our equation we have no input and no output. So then we're left with accumulation is equal to the reaction term. Okay? And usually what, what we're gonna end up with is the accumulation in some volume is equal to the reaction in that same volume, and it just becomes nice and simple, nice and neat, and we can use this approach to study specifically the kinetics of that reaction. Now, it's not very practical to fill up a, a large reactor, especially if you think like a, a large swimming pool. Some of the uh, wastewater or drinking water treatment reactors are, are very large. It doesn't make sense to fill it up, stir it and let the reaction happen, then drain it, put that water into the next process, then fill it up again so you can do it. It's many times, you know, in many cases, it's much more efficient to let water be continuously flowing into it and have a continuous flow system. So the other two reactor types are gonna give us the continuous flow. Um, the batch reactor is more like a lab scale study or a small scale system where you have to do it in batches, right? You do a batch today, do a batch uh, tomorrow, et cetera. Okay, for the, for the reactors, typically we're gonna stick with what we're gonna assume to be ideal reactors. Um, so we're assuming that there is perfect mixing. We don't have to worry about any, um, any mixing issues. So ultimately the accumulation rate becomes that reaction rate. And it's literally a stirred vessel. It could just be a, a jar or something. All right, next would be this continuously stirred tank reactor. Again, several names. I, our book uses CSTR, I'll use CSTR. This is basically the one with continuous flow. It's like the batch, except you have, and it looks like I'm, I messed up the graphics and I apologize. Um, the graphics should have been for the CSTR, this one. In fact, I'll just go ahead and fix it for you. So I think, keep that. Okay, this will work. There we go. Okay, so we have, in this case, the continuously stirred one where we have the inflow coming in and the outflow. So really our mass balance um, ends up looking pretty much exactly like we have it written up here where we have some accumulation rate. If we reach steady state, then we can, that, that means that the accumulation is zero, but we still have stuff coming in, stuff going out in the reaction. So. If we reach steady state, I mean, just a quick reminder here, 
we might have a high concentration of stuff coming in. Let's imagine a concentration here and then we're just going as we flow through the system. The inflow is high concentration. Then when it reaches and instantly mixes with the container, we drop in concentration because we have that reaction happening continuously, reducing what's in there. And then ultimately, because it's completely mixed, whatever's in there is the same stuff that's flowing out. Um, so even, even though we had that, we have that change of boundary here with the output, the concentration is, it's kind of a unique thing about the CSTRs since they're perfectly mixed, again, that assumption, then as soon as the water joins it, it's diluted because it's continuously drawing down that concentration, but also getting this continuous feed and some continuously going out. Uh, you'll see this as we work through some problems um, and we'll, we have an example uh, for in a few minutes, but basically it's, it's just continuously having that reaction, um, or I guess you could have no reaction at all, and then it's just whatever is coming in is going out. Okay, so it should be should start to make sense as we work some problems here. Okay, the last type is a plug flow reactor, and there's two different ways to characterize the math here, and we're going to take the simpler approach. So here we have a continuous input and continuous output, and our reactor is going to be more like a pipe or a hose or something where we have a more narrow channel. The water is going through and what we're going to do is assume that in what we call a plug, in one of these little discs that are shown here, inside one of those we have perfect mixing. But we have no mixing horizontally. So if we, if we were to draw a this conceptual reactor here, just the plug part. So what our assumption is, is that the uh, we're approaching zero width here. So very, a very small width for this react, for this plug. And what we're going to do is assume that we have no mixing horizontally. So the mixing happening sideways forward and backwards does not happen um, now of course it's flowing along it's it's as if it's on a conveyor belt we have one little tiny or very thin rather batch reactor on a conveyor belt and it's just plugging along going through and it's not mixing with its neighbors if we assume that then we can treat it like a batch reactor um, we can model this mathematically a bit differently um, to, to just take a look at what's passing through and have an, having an infinite amount of tiny CSTRs. And that gets us to the same uh, mathematical equation. But for now, we're just going uh, we're just going to assume it as that very thin plug, no mixing horizontally, only within that plug. And it's going to act as that batch reactor on a conveyor belt. This means that the math will turn out to be the same. Um, as a batch reactor, except that instead of for a batch reactor, we have we just let it sit there for some amount of time. In this case, the time is the residence time of the water through through the system. Okay, so however long it takes for the plug of water to make it through the the pipe or through the reactor, that's the amount of time that the reaction has. Okay, so it's very similar, um, but it does bring in the reactor design and the flow rate by taking a look at that, how long does it stay within the system? Okay, on that note, let's uh, get a little more particular about the, that time. So hydraulic retention time. Sometimes you'll see this written as tau, like we just did, um, or residence time. These are synonymous. So when we talk about hydraulic retention time, um, Usually we use theta as our term, and theta is going to be, really it's a key design parameter for a lot of what we're going to do. And it, the definition of theta here is the volume over flow rate. So just V over Q, if we look at this term, um, we say it's a hydraulic retention time, 
and the units are in time and that makes sense when we look at volume we'll use an example meters cubed per let's say meters cubed per day might be a flow rate right so volume per time is a flow rate so um, I guess I was using seconds here so maybe I should do seconds in my example so we'll do meters cubed per second on the bottom and if you work this out to solve for it the meter cube is cancelled and the s the seconds comes on top and you're left with just seconds okay so that's very simple again using units you forget the equation you know that it's got to do with the volume and and the flow going through that volume um, that's really all there is to it so just take a look back through the units i'm not giving you this equation on the exam this is one I, I fully expect you to be working with every time you're solving problems or almost every time. So definitely commit this one to memory. Um, make sure you, you know that one um, basically because you should and it's, it's quite intuitive as well. Okay, and again, this is uh, synonymous with residence time like we just saw in the previous, in the previous um, example or the picture here. Okay. Um, I wanted to give a an example oops, of hydraulic resonance time. Pull this up. Let's see. Just give me a moment. So, speaking of um, actually, speaking of ideal reactors. Um, here's a little graphic of um, essentially a plug flow reactor going across a bend. And it's demonstrating that really, in reality, reactors are not, not always ideal. Um, so this is pretty slow moving. We've got this dye tracer test is what we call it, so that we can visually see what's happening to the flow as it goes through. And we see some areas that have... Um, you know, spots with very little concentration, some spots with too much concentration of the stuff that we're using, and as it flows across, we can see some what we call dead zones that aren't receiving mixing. Um, so our hydraulic retention time, you know, in an ideal reactor, we just assume all of this water is, la is taking the same amount of time to get through the reactor. Reality, that's not always true, um, and we, we can account for it. Um, again, we're going to keep it simple and keep it to ideal reactors. Um, but just wanted to show you this. Yeah. Is this why we don't want our top floor settling in the accumulation equation? So, uh, and for those online, this we were asked about um, not accounting for settling in the accumulation equation. So, settling of uh, particles is what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. So. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, in, a ideal, in an ideal system, we have perfect mixing, and so we wouldn't have settling unless that was our aim. So we will actually look at sedimentation okay. where we're designing settlers, mm -hmm. um, but we're going to treat that kind of separate from chemistry um, and from some other topics. It's a good question because um, in a non-ideal case, I'm, I'm guessing this would be very relevant to a lot of reactors that are trying to make a product or keep a product suspended but you have that non-ideal mixing and then stuff starts settling out where you don't want it mm -hmm. so that, that's a great question and exactly yeah we're going to keep to ideal reactors so that in the case of perfect mixing or something like that we'll we uh, pretend it doesn't exist <laughs> i guess even in the plug flow right it's perfectly mixed vertically but not horizontally so it's um yeah that's that perfect mixing assumption i guess would prevent uh, settling. Okay. All right. So, and then um, just noting here, we're, n we're not really studying this um, ideal reactors. Uh, Non-ideal reactors, sorry. Okay. So, let's get to a little bit of math. Um, again, I mentioned that the reactor type is... Um, not dependent on the reaction order. So I'm going to take the batch case first and derive the mass balance for 
both a zero order and a second and a first order case. When we derive these mass balances, especially for the batch cases and also for the CSTR, it's possible for you to commit the final outcome to memory and so that you know exactly what a zero order growth equation looks like for a batch reactor. I'm okay if you do that, but I don't encourage that because I think this process of getting there is what you're going to need in case you encounter something that's a little bit different. You know, maybe I'll challenge you with something that's not steady state, um, and then you actually have to get down into the nuts and bolts of this mass balance. It'll be basically the same math, you just have a different component there, and I want you to be able to do that type of type of stuff. So I want, you know, I'm not going to stop you from memorizing it though, as if I could, but. I would encourage you to, to get this part down so that you can derive your own mass balances. Okay, for a zero order decay, we're going to start on the left here. I, I chose decay kind of arbitrarily. We could have derived this for the positive, and you'll see if you do the math, it's not too much different. It's just what it looks like in the end is a bit different. Okay, so in our batch case, our accumulation rate is equal to input minus output rates plus whatever reaction we have. So in this case, we have no inputs and no outputs, and our net reaction term, I do plus reaction, and that's really the any growth minus any decay. So this will end up being a negative term because our reaction right here has a negative. Okay, so we want to do this, we, and we want to do it in some volume. Okay, so our batch reactor, we have, it's perfectly mixed. And that's that. You know, we've got some um, some liquid in it. Where did my? Here we go. Got some liquid in it, and it's perfectly mixed. All right. So, when we come to start solving a problem, we want to define it as in some volume. We have the change in concentration per change in time, okay? And we're gonna say this is gonna be equal to um, really just negative K is pretty much the whole equation in that volume. So I'm gonna multiply it by the volume here, um, really just multiplying both sides by the volume. Since we have no other inputs or outputs and we've already written it as this accumulation rate is essentially equal to um, equal to the reaction rate, this is all it is. This is our full mass balance. And so in order to start solving it, we can simplify and say, okay, the volume terms go away. And effectively, we're left with dc dt is equal to negative k. Now, this obviously is relatively easy to integrate. Um, so let's go ahead and do so. We're gonna integrate um, by parts, so we have dc, uh, the integral of dc from c initial to c final equal to negative k times the integral of dt from zero to t. Okay, and this is going to be um, the basis of our process whenever we're solving one of these, um, kind of in one of these forms. Okay, so then this will turn out to say on the left side we have C minus C naught. And on the right we'll have um, really just negative KT because the, the, it went from 0 to T. So that's basically it for the solution to our mass balance. And once we get this far, then we want to take a look at, all right, what are we actually solving for? Did we want to know the time it takes in this reactor? Do we solve for time here? Do we want to know the starting concentration we needed, needed to get to the final concentration given? Or you know, what is the parameters that we're asked for? So here, again, um, it, you could memorize the final solution in terms of, let's say, just concentration, which I'll go ahead and give you now. So that would be C is equal to C naught minus KT, right? That's, that would probably be the, the simplest way to write it. Chances are 
you've seen equations in that form before. All right, so that's zero order decay um, once we integrate it and all that. Now, you could memorize that, but then if you have to solve for t, you have to go from that step. Sometimes it might be easier if you're solving from t to go from the step before. And as you'll see when we get to the CSTRs, sometimes it's a little bit more complex, maybe a little more worthwhile to um, do this um, to, to start solving for that solution for what you need earlier on in the process. Okay, uh, we'll do a first order decay now. So we have kind of the same setup, except this time we have the dependence of 1 in the, uh, in the rate equation. So we'll do the same thing, uh, V dc dt equals V times negative kc. Vs will cancel, because we can go ahead and do that right away. And we're left with dc dt equals negative kc. When we integrate this, again, we will integrate by parts. What we're going to do is take dc and get the concentration on the left side. So we're going to divide by c. So dc over c, or, or we could also integrate it as 1 over c dc, right? That's so the same thing um, effectively. And this, again, is going from C0 to C. And on the right side, we'll just have negative K and the integral of dt from 0 to t. OK, so the right side basically stays the same. Now, this is kind of the one thing you'll have to remember from calculus in order to make, um, make this process more convenient. And that is the integral of 1 over x dx is natural log of x. Um, so when we do this, you'll see that here we, we end up with the natural log of c minus the natural log of c0 is equal to negative kt. All right, one other thing that you should remember at this point is an algebra trick with the natural logs. If you have, if you have um, natural log of something minus the natural log of something else, you can actually just do natural log of that something over something else. So it, it's kind of one of these shortcuts where it's natural log of C divided by C naught. It's mathematically equivalent, uh, equals negative KT. Now I have a question from the chat. Um, asking why do we multiply by both sides by volume again? And the reason we're gonna, the reason I'm writing that out, even though I'm just uh, canceling it out a moment later, is because when we get to the CSTRs, we should write it out, and we don't have the ability to cancel it right away because we're looking at this reaction in a specific volume. So, uh, in this case, our entire accumulation in this volume is. Um, is that rate, the rate at which stuff is changing in that volume, so it just cancels. But later we'll do volume times accumulation is equal to, um, you know, all these components, and the volume is carried through the whole system. Uh, it'll make a little more sense once we derive that one. Um, that's a good question. Okay, so by the time we're at this form, it should start looking very familiar, um, and from here, since on my screen it's kind of running out of room. We also have, for those viewers online, the bottom right is uh, blocked out as well. So I'm going to come up here. Um, and you know, if you take the both sides, you raise e to the power of both sides here, you can get rid of the natural log. And you're left with c over c0 equals e to the minus kt. And if you want to, you can simplify further and say c equals c0 e to the minus kt. So we just derived that equation used back in algebra for your you know, interest rates. Now if you had a, you know, if you're doing a growth reaction, in this case you just flip that negative. Okay, it, it gets a little more complicated for um, CSTRs. You can't just flip a negative. It's not too different, but it's a little more involved. 
So what I would encourage you to do is go back and do this for a growth equation, okay? Just to double check that you've got this process, you understand what's gonna happen if you flip that sign. Um, we're not always dealing with decay reactions. I'm just using these as the example. Will be the most common. All right, any questions on that before we move to the CSTRs? Is the handwriting working out okay? It doesn't look very good on my screen because I'm looking at it this big. <laughs> so just let me know if there is any um, unclarity and I'll, I'll try to fix it. Okay, one other thing I wanted to mention here. Um, this process, uh, really we can take the same exact process and use it for plug flow reactors. I mentioned this earlier, but instead of the time here, we would substitute for the the theta or the tau, the residence time, how long it takes the water to go through um, and get to the end of the reactor. Okay, awesome, thank you. All right. So we'll move on and do the CSTR case. In this case, our accumulation rate, we do have an input and we do have an output. Uh, again, just as a quick reminder, in this case, we have continuously mixed um, reactor with an input and an output. Okay, and so there's an input flow, has some concentration of whatever is reacting, and an output flow with whatever concentrations inside here. Um, if we're gonna be thorough about it, we would describe it with a volume. We would put, okay, some concentration. We'd have Q for the flow rate, some C naught, and this would be Q and C final. Okay, and we'll look at an example in just a couple minutes for that. All right, so for a zero order equation, again, we're starting with the same, at the same point. We have uh, our rate equation, and we're gonna look at how to put that into this total mass balance. So last time we said no input, no output, accumulation rate is equal to that reaction. Uh, in this case, what we're gonna do is say that Essentially, you know, in, we can start by saying the accumulation rate. Um, usually we're gonna assume steady state and we'll do that in a moment, but for now I'm just gonna write it here as accumulation. This is going to be equal to um, this Qn times C naught minus Q out Usually we're gonna have Q in is equal to Q out, assuming there's just one, one in and one out. Um, then plus the reaction term, this time we're gonna do a decay reaction. So I'm gonna say plus the reaction term, and the reaction term is gonna be the negative KV. And I put it as negative KV because we need the reaction in the total volume and the, uh, we know it's a zero order, so there's no C, this becomes one, and then we're just left with the negative K. Okay, so we're just left with the negative K. So this is effectively our mass balance. Now, if we do, if we make the steady state assumption, yeah? Why would the Q out there just be by itself, but the Q in is multiplied by C in It That was just a mistake. You're exactly right, this should be Q times C, so I'm gonna rewrite that. So this should be, and thank you for catching that, oops. This should be Q out times, times C. And you could have, could have noticed that by the units, if not by uh, just simply looking and noticing that it's wrong. Yeah, so it should be Q times C in, so that C naught, minus Q times C out, plus, an, in this case, a negative KV. Uh, the plus there gives us the opportunity to do plus or minus based on our reaction term. Okay, so if we make the steady state assumption, which it's usually 
safe to do so if we have the same amount coming in for a long period of time. That long period of time lets the whole system reach an equilibrium. And, uh, and I think the problem that we'll, we'll look at in a minute um, basically does that same thing. It's like, okay, for all, this stream is continuously flowing with this after a long time, such and such uh, solve this problem. So steady state, that means um, zero equals this Q C naught minus Q C minus K V. Okay. So from there, um, one thing that's often pretty handy to do at this point is since we know that Q is going to be the same, right? We're not accumulating more and more water in the system because that would be difficult to handle or rather depleting it. Um, we're just keeping the Q in and the Q out the same. That's very typical. And so I just wrote them both as Q here. Now, at this point, we're kind of working towards solving for C. And so it makes a lot of sense to go ahead and divide by Q. So if we divide all terms by Q, and I'm just going to say uh, divide by Q, then we'll have 0, because 0 divided by Q is still 0, equals C naught minus C minus K. And this time, I'm going to write theta, because V over Q is theta. And when we divided this term, this KV by Q, we just get theta. All right, so you could leave it as V over Q, um, but sometimes you're going to want to give me the answer of the hydraulic retention time required, something like that. So either way, it uh, should be fine, and then you can solve this pretty easily. You know, C equals, you just add it to both sides, C equals C naught um, minus K theta. And then that would be your the solution to the mass balance here. All right. Does that make sense? Okay. So then to do this with a um, with a first order, uh, I'm going to start basically on the same on the same path. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make the first the uh, steady state assumption but you can see here if you didn't make the steady state assumption you could leave um, you could leave room here for some accumulation rate that would be some form of mass per time and you you could uh, figure out you know and, and there's a problem in the book that we might take a look at um, where it's you eat a hamburger and then you stop eating and then the hamburger is being digested in your stomach and we're treating that as a reactor and as it's being digested you have a, a decay rate of the amount of hamburger left there and you have a flow rate of it going out but no input rate and so you have a non-steady state system but it's relatively simple because it's kind of like a CSTR without the input um, so that that's an example where we might do a, a non-steady state system and you'd have to have this accumulation rate and and determine okay how quickly is it leaving the leaving the um, stomach all right so in this case we're going to do steady state assumption so zero equals what's coming in q c naught minus what's going out q c plus the reaction term which in this case because it's a first order this is going to be negative k c in that volume, negative KCV. So again, I just took that directly from here in the volume that we're occupying. All right. So that's that's where we're getting that reaction term. So a lot of a lot of the differences that we look at, you know, we're we're deriving kind of the the base scenario here, and then when we get to sedimentation, we'll have some reaction on that's determined by how quickly the particles stick together. And that's going to go into this rate constant here and what that rate equation looks like. But ultimately, it'll all come into the same generic form when we go to solve, uh, solve the problem. OK. From here, we have um, basically the same thing as we just had. 
and it'll make sense again to divide everything by Q. So we'll go ahead and do that. We'll say divide by Q. So zero, that looks like a theta, so I'm gonna, oops. Zero equals C naught Okay, C naught minus C, this time minus, um, we have K, C, V, so it'll be K, C, theta. Okay, it gets slightly more complicated now that we have two C's in the equation, but, you know, let's, assuming we're solving for C, you know, it would be simpler if we're just solving for the initial concentration, but assuming we're going to solve for C here, then we have to do a little bit of separation, and we can say get C's, the two C's on both one side. We'll have C plus um, C K theta equals C naught. So just adding them to both sides, we can pull out the C and have C times one plus K theta equals C naught, and then divide both sides by one plus k theta. So c equals c naught over one plus k theta. All right, in this case, if we had a decay reaction, I think the solution is just flipping this negative, but I would have to go back and double check, excuse me, a uh, growth equation. Um, but you'd want to go back and double check to make sure that math follows, because there's a little bit more involved this time. Um, one thing that we might see uh, sometimes is you, you actually don't want to solve for just C, maybe it's C over C naught to give you the ratio of the stuff that's remaining there compared to what you started with. That's pretty simple, you know, you just divide both sides by C naught. You have C over C naught equals one over one plus K theta, which is also a very common form for this mass balance derivation. Okay, so that gives you the tools we need for just about all the problems, right? We have the batch reactor, we have the plug flow reactor, which we are able to assume is essentially the batch if we take the residence time instead of just a, a batch time. And now we have the CSTR. We can put different reactions in it, and the reaction, the overall mass balance changes a little bit, but we have basically some sort of form that we can work with um, and we can solve for different parameters with. So that's essentially the class. Um, and we'll get into some specifics. Uh, let's take a little bit of practice here. So this is example 1.5, page 14. And we are told to consider a 10 by, uh, excuse me, a 10 times 10 to the 6, so 10 million uh, cubic meter lake fed by a polluted stream having a flow rate of 5 cubic meters per second and a, with a pollutant concentration of 10 milligrams per liter. We're not even caring about the pollutant, what it is at this point. We're just a generic pollutant. Uh, it's fed also by a sewage outfall with a discharge of half a cubic meter per second of wastewater, and that has a pollutant concentration of 100 milligrams per liter, so a higher concentration stream from the waste, wastewater outfall. Uh, the stream and sewage wastes have a decay rate coefficient of 0 0.20 per day and you'll notice uh, the units there. Uh, assuming the pollutant is completely mixed in the lake, and that's, again, a hint at what type of reactor we're dealing with, um, and assuming no evaporation or other water losses or gains, find the steady state pollution concentration in the lake. Okay, so as we start thinking about this before we even think about an equation, uh, let me just highlight a couple things so we have two inputs. We know that much. It's a decay reaction that we're going to be modeling with the pollutant. Um, and that rate coefficient, that's going to be effectively our rate constant. Uh, the units are in, where did my, here we are. The units are in per day. So that per day there, 
is telling us effectively that we, uh, we are a first order equation, right? Because we took a look at what the units, you know, how the units correspond to the rate order. So those two pieces of information give us all we need to know about the rate itself, um, especially given the rate constant. And then the last thing, uh, well, the last two things, we make this assumption that we don't have any evaporation or other additions or subtractions from the volume. So that means we have a, a balance of the amount of water coming in and going out. That's important. It would be a lot more complex if we had to change, you know, okay, well, some of it's evaporating and all that. We could do it, but it would just add complexity. So it's a sec essentially going to act like an ideal reactor. It said uh, completely mixed, and then it finally said steady state. So we know that we're looking at a net zero accumulation rate. All right, so and then if we take a look at the, um, the picture here, we have basically everything labeled. So all the information we need, we've got the Q in uh, and the concentration in for the two different uh, inputs. We have an output of you know, whatever the combined flow is and some mysterious concentration that we need to solve for. It's given the volume. So what I'm going to do is just put that uh, picture up here. We're solving for C. And I'm going to let you take a couple minutes. Um, you know what I'll do is I'll let you take the rest of the class to, to look at it. Um, and I'll, I'll write up the, maybe the first couple steps. And then when we come back next time, we'll, we'll finish this one out. So just take a couple minutes as you approach it and try to solve for it. Let me know if you've got any questions. I'll dismiss you in a few minutes and, and we'll, uh, we'll solve it together next time. Yeah, and feel free to work together. Yeah, so the, and actually that's probably the one piece of information that was on the previous slide. Um, so let me come back over here. So when we took a look and it was describing the, um, the and the question is how do we know what, what order the reaction is in, they gave us a decay coefficient and gave us the units for it. So to decide what order we have to look at those units, these, uh, these units are per time, so that per day. So then if you remember from earlier, we were taking a look at Okay, the different reaction orders. Um, turns out if you do that math to see, okay, you have K times C, and the net of that has to be mass per volume per time. What does the K have to be? And in this case, you have K times C. C is already in mass per volume, so all you're missing is the per time. So then it has to be per time for first order. So that, since we see this in uh, per time units, we know it's a first order equation first order uh, reaction.
with with the lake itself? Is that so with the lake? So what I would say is um, we'd probably draw the control volume at the lake boundaries. So if we if we take a look, and the, and the question is, if I'm understanding you right, the um, you know, what all counts as the inputs. So I would draw the control volume like this, and so the inputs would be um, this plus this input here. So both of those would be inputs. You could combine them into one term. Um, uh, that's fine. Um, in fact, I guess you should, you have to combine them into that input term, essentially. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah, so you wouldn't incorporate the, the middle with the input for that. Right, yeah, this is just the, essentially the reactor itself. Um, yeah. It's given some volume and some concentration, just like we would with a, a tank or something. Okay. Yeah, and we've got a question here as well in the uh, in the chat. Does C equal CM? So, um, so here the uh, and I'm sorry the graphics is a little bit blurry, but it says CM over here on the outgoing, basically C mixed or um, I guess C of the mixture because it's a CSTR. Um, exactly. Uh, we assume that it is C equals CM because we're told it's completely mixed. That means that any concentration anywhere inside that control volume is the same, and that's also what's leaving. So that, that would mean C equals CM. All right, so um, that's the end of class. I'll, uh, I'll work this through with you next time. Um, I'll hang out here another minute or two in case there's any questions, but um, you're dismissed. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll be aiming to post a homework before next class. Um, and if I get it to you before the weekend, I'll probably have it due next Thursday. I still need to decide what I'm going to do about online submissions. Uh, I'll let you know. I can do it through Moodle, it just takes a little bit more work to set it up on the front end, but then the grading is a little faster, so I'll, I'll let you guys know. I have a quick question. So we know yep. it's a first order because it, um, it's over just time by itself, mm -hmm. but zero order on the constant, isn't it? It's uh, milligrams over liters per second. Yeah. So if, uh, if K had um, the volume in there? I mean the yeah, so if K was given at like milligrams per liter per day, okay. then so you'd know it was a zero order. So like whenever you're working problems, I just like look exact, like look for the constants yeah, and then you can know which one to work with? Exactly. So that, that's your, one of your clues in, in terms of how to, how to solve the problem is looking right there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Post like a, bl a blank PowerPoint like um, before each class? Before, because so, I have like a tablet uh -huh. for other people.